of the Gospel of John. This is where we'll finish this morning. Next week we'll, Lord willing, move into Galatians. But we have been looking here at some post-resurrection lessons, reminders for us as we finished celebrating the Easter and the Lord's death on the cross for us. And we're reminded that Jesus met with His disciples over a period of 40 days after His death as, a resur- in, as, the, as the resurrected Savior. And He told the disciples, as we know, to go on to to Galilee where he'd meet them specifically to a mountain Matthew 28:16 and there he would meet them there and as we have observed over the last several Sundays John records records this appearance in Galilee and we observed four lessons or four reminders of ministry in this text for us as the church noted in our outlines our outline this morning, our purpose and provision, a refining and restoration that God does for a servant's cost and commitment of service and assurance of things written. We have looked at this and spent time. We looked several weeks ago, God's purpose, His provision, reminding us that He is with us. We remember that as we observed that the disciples were distracted, Peter, their leader, decided to go back fishing Six of the disciples followed him. Remember that they were distracted from their purpose. And Jesus reminded them as they went out to to fish and they caught nothing. It was not that fishing was evil. Wives, it's it's not evil. 
nor a dishonorable profession. It was that it was not what God had called them to do. They were distracted from their purpose. And the same thing happens to us. We may not have fishing as a profession or whatever as a profession. But they can be distractions and keep us from what God has called us to do. And so, they were to be fishers of men. How does this apply to us today? Though we have, again, many responsibilities and, and priorities, there is one that is greater, one priority that is greater than all, the calling and the commission of Christ. We were created to glorify Christ in everything that we do, and, and everything of this world is finite. It is fleeting. For Paul says to the Colossians, as I just read in my prayer, he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His beloved Son. For He rescued us from the dominion of darkness. It's amazing. Colossians 3, 1-2 says, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, the Father. He says, Then set your mind on the things above and not on the things below. Where are our minds during the week? Where do we go? We have been called as a church as witnesses, workers for the gospel, and to such end Christ provides. He is with us just as He is with the disciples, showing them as He provided for them. He says, put the net down on the right side. They fished all night catching nothing, and Jesus said the words, and the net was full. It is God's work. It is God's provision, God's power to carry it out. We are His servants, resting in Him. He is the vine. We are the branches. We are to abide in the vine. It is God that sustains us. He is with us. He'll never forsake us. He is with us even to the end of the age, Matthew 28 and 19. So ask yourself, or I ask you, are you struggling are you struggling day to day? Are you struggling in your walk, in your life? Draw from the vine, which is Christ. If you are struggling, it is that you are not drawing because God is sufficient. It is sufficient. He is sufficient Himself. His Word is sufficient. Peter, as we know, denied Jesus three times. We know not only he was distracted, but he was obviously needed to be restored. We talked about this. He knew that he was forgiven, but it is evident that Peter, as we talked about, was, was no longer confident that the Lord wanted him or could use him. He was aloof. I'm going fishing. And as, P, as we noted, Peter was a natural leader, but he was not ready to lead. God is always sanctifying us. Peter struggled particularly with pride. We talked about that. Pride. How do we know? Jesus said, you will deny me. Peter says, no, I won't deny you. No, you will deny me. Three times, oh no. I will even go to death with you. Guess what Peter did? He denied Christ three times as the, as the rooster crowed, as Jesus told him it was. It was not Peter's passion that got him into trouble with the Lord. It was his pride in not listening to the Lord. Getting out in front of the Lord. I'm glad that we don't struggle with those sins. Pride is the first sin. It's the most common sin. It's the sin we struggle with most. Proverbs 11.2 says, When pride comes, then comes the dishonor, but with the humble is wisdom. Wisdom. We talked about that yesterday in men's breakfast. Sophia. We know that Peter learned this as when Jesus asked him three times, remember last week we talked, that Peter, that Jesus said, Peter, do you love me, agapeo? Do you love me? With a volitional love, an unconditional love. And certainly Peter did, but Peter responded all three times, phileo, which is a brotherly love, an affectionate love. As we noted, it's used both of Christ and uh, throughout John. But here, very specifically, he plays on words and 
In fact, Jesus switches the last one. Do you phileo love me? And Peter says, you know I love you, Lord. You know I do. Peter knew that Jesus knew all things. He learned that specifically the night which he betrayed, betrayed Jesus. It's very clear to him now. Why did Peter not respond with agape as we, as we shared? Peter certainly loved Jesus with an agape of love, but he was not going to make the mistake coming across as boastful again. He had learned humility. He learned humility, and God used him mightily. In fact, just read 1 Peter. Read 1 Peter. We're reminded that Jesus knew this. He, he planned this for Peter. In fact, you remember earlier in Luke, the, Luke's gospel, it said that once you have turned again, Jesus says, that you would lead and strengthen his brothers. Peter had learned humility and was ready to humbly serve the Savior. Peter learned that God disciplines those whom he loves. Discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. Yet, Hebrew, the writer of Hebrews says that those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields a peaceful peacefulness and right, uh, a, the peaceful fruit of righteousness. But we have to be listening and hearing. And indeed, Peter learned. He wrote to the church leaders. Remember this I shared last week. You can look at it. It's in 1 Peter 5, 2 through 6. And probably should underline it. Those who are shepherding your flock, for sure. Those who are leading over their families. Don't exercise oversight under compulsion, but voluntarily com according to the will of God. And not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive an unfading un un uh, crown of glory. But then it says, you younger men, likewise be subject to your elders, to your leaders, and all of you, all of you, all of us, clothe yourself in pride. Is that what it says? No, that's our natural bent. In hum with humility toward one another, God opposed, is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at a proper time, at the proper time. I'm sure Peter's thinking exactly what you're thinking. It must have been when he restored Peter, he learned humility. How was our listening? How was our listening? Are we listening to the Lord? This leads us now to the third post-resurrection lesson. We looked at Peter's refining restoration. We're going to look this morning at a cost and commitment. Cost and commitment. For this listening and learning is equally true with this third lesson and reminder. Here we see Jesus continuing to speak with Peter away from the others. He's still having this conversation with Peter. Having restored Peter, Jesus tells Peter of the cost of ministry that he will incur, the cost of ministry that some will incur, as well as the commitment he needs to have and declares to him in relation regardless of others. We see this first in verses 18 through 19, the cost of, of ministry. Again, Jesus has just, re, just finished restoring Peter. Do you love me, Peter? Feed my sheep. Tend to my sheep. And then he tells him of the challenges from without that he will face. Not only will face, but he'll face it with certainty. This is going to happen, Peter. Notice what he says in verses 18 through 19. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bind or bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this says, 
Now, this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said, follow me. Here Jesus says, truly, truly. Now, it's important to understand that when Jesus in the Scriptures repeat a word, it means we should be listening. We should be listening. Truly is the word uh, literally in the Greek, amin. Only Jesus uses the saying at the beginning of a sentence because amin, uh, or we, our modern our English would say amen. It means true, with certainty, truly, I say, or amen, this is true. And here he uses a double statement, truly, truly, I say to you, he says. Spiros Zodiades in his complete word study dictionary says, verily, verily, I say to you, could be rendered, I am, I who am the amen, or the amen, Truth itself tell you as a most certain and infallible truth, Peter. This is certain as all his words were certain. Everything that Jesus says is certain because he is the way and the truth and the life. Every word he says is true. Absolute will come to pass. And God reminds this to Peter. Jesus reminds this to Peter. What was this certain and infallible truth? Jesus tells Peter that he will suffer a martyr's death. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not want to go. Now, some look at this who and say that Jesus was just saying to Peter that he was going to live a long life, an old age. And in old age, you know, people, you know, try to lead us around when we get older. It's true. Sometimes we need it. Appreciate the help. Some explain this passage, meaning that when Peter was young, he used to be able to do what he wanted to do as youthful, and as youth would allow him to do, walking wherever he wished, but when he was old and no longer would be would carry on like he did when he was young, but would need to be, be led about. And, and this understanding, certainly as you just read it, isolate it, it would seem that that's what he's saying. But I think Jesus is saying more than this. In fact, we see this from the context of this passage. We see it also from the context of, of Scripture. But Peter is meaning here is the exact, or Jesus' meaning here is the exact opposite. In fact, Peter himself did not understand it this way. That is, that he's going to be led around when he's old. In fact, he understood it, that he was going to be martyred. In fact, we read in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 through 15, Peter says this, uh, speaking to the church, telling those suffering for their faith to continue in the excellency of Christ. And he says this, I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent. So also our, also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. Jesus told him. He's re- thinking back to what Jesus had told him. The imminency of his death was not because he was getting old, but because he was going to be martyred. That's what Jesus was telling him. This, is, this may be what Jesus meant in John 13, 36 when John, uh, when uh, 36, 37, when Jesus tells him that Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Peter is, uh, Jesus is in the upper room, remember, or there in uh, the garden and tells them, this is right before, Jesus, before, P- before Peter says, I will follow you to, to death. Jesus says, where I am going, you cannot follow me, but you will follow later. Speaking of where he's going right now, he's going to be crucified. You will follow me later of the certainty. And so verse 37, Peter said, Lord, I, why can't I follow you right now? I will, I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus is now saying, yes, yes, you will. You will. And there are many references that we study history of Peter's death the truth of this, the reference of the early church fathers, P- 
Peter died a martyr's death. Clement of Rome, who one of the early church fathers who lived in, or, and died in the first century, he lived and he died in, uh, in 100 A.D., mentions that martyr, martyrdom of Peter, but not the place. Ignatius of Antioch, who died in 107 A.D., instinctively mentions Peter's martyrdom as well as later church leaders Dionysius of Corinth and Irenaeus of Lyons all mention Peter's martyrdom. Eusebius, which is an early Christian church historian, historian 260 to 340 A.D., reported that Peter was crucified upside down. That was what uh, what has what, what been uh, passed down. And there is evidence from other early church writings that they, they stretched out his hands, referring to crucifixion. Again, to what John says of what happened, records what Jesus said about what happened to Peter. Tertullian, another early church father, 160 to 224 A.D., wrote that Peter died by the hands of Nero, which makes sense because Paul died by the hands of Nero. And here, Peter dealing with those in Rome. For 200 years, persecution had, had, had persisted in a great and horrible fashion against Christians in the Roman Empire under rulers such as Nero, Domitian, uh, Decius, Diocletian, and others. So gruesome was the persecution that it's hard to even read if you go back and read what took place and what historians speak about what Eusebius speaks about. So gruesome were the persecutions of Christians that I can't even read it this morning. There was mass persecution. And so great it, it should make us any present day Christian ashamed when they complain about what, what is comparably, comparably light affliction. Mass persecution did not end until Constantine. It's interesting that historian, uh, one of the historians mentioned that, that uh, in fact, historian John Foster writes that when Constantine legalized and promoted Christianity, the church, he says, was now, the church was now to be faced by dangers that, that were different from persecution. The danger of worldliness, misuse of power, lowering of moral standards, and the existence of many heretical and schismatic groups even among its own leaders. Sound familiar? Don't get me wrong, persecution continues around the world. We read it every day. In fact, John brings it up every second Sunday of the persecuted church. This last Sunday, he brought up and highlighted Somalia. Somalia, only 0.8% Christian, 98.6% Muslim. To be a Christian there is, is with many, as with many other countries, is costly. He shared in the update newsletter of those who were killed for their faith. And you read it every day if you get the uh, voice of the martyrs or if you uh, uh, receive those periodicals, the update on those who are dying for their faith, young people, because they name the name of Christ. It is costly. And the question always comes up, why would God allow such suffering? Why would He take away and even allow missionaries to die? You think of Jim Elliot and those with New Tribes mission back then. Why would Jim Elliot, why, why would God allow that and others there? Well, we've seen the fruit of what took place with and with many others, because God desires, in fact, to be glorified. Isn't that what God says here? Jesus says this right here in our text. Why does God allow this? Why is He going to allow Peter to suffer? Why is He going to allow Peter to be martyred in such a way? He says this, 
Know this, he said, signif- signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. It is hard for us to grasp the, the purpose of the Lord in suffering. It's hard for us because we, we, we think that everything should be just, just easy and pleasant because we're Christians. No, we still, yes, we're Christians. We live in a world that is depraved, and we are to be a light in it, and it can be costly. It's the cost of ministry. Today in our society, we not, may not be, be uh, hung or strung up or killed immediately, but we might be canceled, uh, set apart, excluded, all of these things because of Christ and of which Christ warned us of, told us of. They will hate you because they, and they hated me first. And we must understand that persecution is never without purpose, never without God's glory intended. Peter certainly learned. Let's turn over to 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 17. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 17. Peter himself not only wrote of his death, as we just noted in 2 Peter verses 1, 13, but here in 1 Peter 4, 12 through, through 17, Peter speaks of the trials. We spoke of this last week. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you. Don't, don't be surprised by this which comes upon you for your testing, for your sanctification, for your approving. As though some strange things were happening to you, like this shouldn't happen to me because I'm a Christian. No, it's exactly what's going to happen. Jesus told us. But to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing. What? Rejoicing? Peter. Peter learned this, didn't he? So that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exaltation. Verse 14, if you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed. That's strange. Because the spirit of the glory and of God rests on you. It is Christ who has made you bold. It is Christ who has done that through you. Make sure that none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or evildoer or a troublesome meddler, but if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. And then he goes on, for it is time for judgment to begin with the house of God. And if it begins with, with us first, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the God, gospel of God? Speaking that God refines the church, he will judge us. He allows that to, to bring about purity within the church. And if God does that to the church, he, he tells the unbeliever, how much more will that be for you? How much greater if God disciplines his own? Paul to Timothy said, Lord, 2 Timothy 4.18, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever. Amen. The same passage of 1 Peter, verse 19 of chapter 4 says, Therefore those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to the faithful creator in doing what is right. God is sovereign over our suffering for his glory. And though we may not see it now or even understand it, this side of heaven, we must come back to the words of Scripture concerning who God is and his promises. I was reading in Lamentations. I was sulking this week, Lamentations right now. I was reading in Lamentations. Jeremiah. In Lamentations chapter 3, he is... in the first 18 verses, he is, he is sulking. He is overwhelmed uh, before God, asking God why. And then in verse 19, the following reminder. Remember, Jeremiah had a pretty tough ministry. Don't even know if he had any converts in his ministry. And he says in verse 19, he says, Remember my affliction and my wandering, the wormwood uh, worm and bitterness, he says, Lord. Remember this. Surely my soul remembers and is bowed down within me. But then verse 21 says, 
This I recall in my mind. Therefore I have hope. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease. For His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I have hope in Him. The Lord is good to those who wait for Him, to the person who seeks Him. David reminded, David wrote on his trials, Psalm 27, 13 through 14, I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Again, though we may not see it now or ever understand it this side, we need to trust what God says in His Word. We know, Romans 8.28, that we say that just almost like a cliche, but God does cause all things to work together for good to those who love God. God is providential. God is providential in everything. Everything. Later in Lamentations, Jeremiah writes, those who speak and do, do not do it apart from from God's sovereignty, basically. Does God not allow both good and ill to come by His plan? Yes, yes, He does. For His glory. For His glory. 2019 missionaries in Afghanistan, they were from a Dutch Reformed church in South Africa. They were martyred in Afghanistan. This was before, obviously, the U.S., Withdrew tells you how bad it was there. Werner Grunwald was a pastor. His wife, Hanelli, was a doctor. And they went to Afghanistan with their two children, teenage children, Rene and Jean-Pierre, knowing that they were called to bring the gospel. They're there to present the gospel to the Afghans. And the clinic where Hanelli worked had been put on alert by the UN that the Taliban were planning to attack Cabal and were to prepare for the wounded. And, And she would never have guessed it was the complex where they lived and ministered. The target was them. Werner, her husband, and her children, Renee and Jean-Pierre, were shot by the Taliban. She writes later, I don't think we'll even know 100% what the impact of what we made in Afghanistan through the years would be, she said. I think that we will know that one day, though when we are in front of the Lord, but I believe that we made an impact on people's lives. I believe also that my family's blood that was shed is like the seed seed for the Afghan church and that there will be a thousandfold harvest in the end because I believe God has the last move. Unless she understood that God was sovereign and providential in this, she wouldn't be able to say those words. She later wrote, It is easy for Christians to worship the Lord on Sundays in church and praise Him, but it is difficult to have a heartfelt obedience to the Lord and go when He calls you. She says, I believe that there is a price tag attached to being a real born-again believer. Jesus was crucified and persecuted. Persecuted himself. He was crucified, and we, his students, can expect nothing more and less than our Savior. It will happen to us if, if you really live a life for Christ that is that of a born-again believer, following the Lord in obedience, there will be a price to pay, she says. Now you can imagine here with Peter, because the Lord tells us in the Scripture, in fact, Paul says, reminds us here, certainly that this is the call of Christ is purposeful in suffering. Second Corinthians, or Second Timothy 3.12 says, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. We're familiar with that verse. 
Paul also says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, that it has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. Right? Th- those are not the verses you have above your window, right? Are, are those the verses you have? God bless this home. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. And right below that, it's been granted for me to suffer. I don't think that's probably your, your, uh, your life verse, is it? I mean, you can imagine what was going through Peter's head here when Jesus tells him this. The only way I can imagine uh, it is if, as if a doctor would say to us in this concept, you are, you are going to die young because you have this rare disease. How am I going to take that? How is Peter to take this? This is, this is overwhelming. Jesus tells him, this is how you take it. This is how. Jesus says, when he had spoken this, he said to him, Peter, follow me. You follow me. This follow, word follow, a couple of theo, here in the, is a present imperative uh, uh, conveys the meaning to continually follow. Don't, don't let up. Don't lose focus. Follow me. Keep your eyes on me. I love that difference between girls and boys and little girls. I was just talking to one of our families who had a little girl who was talking to another and uh, she was talking, a little girl was talking to this young, her, I think her cousin and uh, he wasn't looking and so she grabs his face. Look at me. Look in my eyes. Look at me. That's the way girls are. Guys are squirrel. And the girls are, look at me. And this is the point Jesus says, look at me, Peter, look at me. Follow me. I am with you. Peter later writes in 1 Peter 2.21, he says, for you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his footsteps. This is Peter now speaking through the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 12, 3 says this, that for consider him who has endured such hostility as by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Jesus says, follow me. Look at me. I am with you. If you truly seek to follow Christ, we will have challenges that will come from without And Jesus' words are the same to us. Follow me. Look at me. I am with you. Matthew 8, 28, 20. Now Jesus is not done here with Peter. Peter learns another lesson here. The commitment of ministry that we are called to. The commitment of ministry that we are called to. Notice this here in our text. We read here in, in verses 20 through 21. Look there with me. This is Peter coming and John is, is recording this. But, and uh, Peter does what so many people do. So many of us do. Not only... Uh, in ministry, but in all aspects of life. We, we, rather than focus on what Christ has called us to or where He has placed us, whether it be suffering of, of, uh, when others don't, perceived success of others that we don't, a ministry that others have that we don't, that's more public than we don't, we kind of get this thought process and this, this view, really like the Corinthians with the gifts, right? Well, some have those, those prophetic gifts. I want those gifts. And And Paul says, no, those aren't for everyone. I need to instruct you and correct you. And oftentimes in ministry, we think the same way that the place to serve is the place where everyone can see or or minister most, most ministered and, and where ministries are most prized, right? Or as here with Peter, how God may choose to use others in different ways and and allow others to suffer where he doesn't. And so put yourself here in, in Peter's 
place here. The narrative John records here of Peter and Jesus' word. Jesus just told Peter of the kind of death he would suffer and result of following him. And Peter made this, this, very, this very commitment before Jesus on the cross. I will follow you till death. And I believe he was sincere in this, this statement. I know he was sincere. He said it. He repeats it. And he's willing to follow Jesus wherever he led him. And Jesus did die for his faith. But just then, here we see in this context that Peter realized the cost of that commitment. And the cost that Jesus said was to was his future. And then he turned and Peter saw John, who was following them. Notice it says here, Peter turned around. Peter turned around and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, following them and the, and the one also who had leaned back on his bosom at the supper and said, and this is John, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? And so Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? What about this man? Now John here identifies himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. It wasn't that he was like, Peter, Jesus loves me more than you. It was rather just recognition of Christ's love, not only for him, but for his disciples. And that's how he identified himself here in the book of John. But Peter turns and he sees John following them and knowing that, that what Jesus had just told him in his mind, in the flesh. And so what about this man? What about, what about John? Don't we get that? Peter, Peter, who said he would die for Jesus when told he would, here develops maybe a, a complex, maybe something, wait a minute, what, why do I have to do this? What about John? What about the others? All of us have experienced this, this problem, have we not? Have you ever experienced that? Feeling that you're not where God wants you to be? Why am I here? Why did they get a promotion? Why am I not in this particular ministry? Why, 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 Lord? Why is Mary not working with me, as Martha would say? In some cases, again, it reveals that self and, and things that have happened in the past and, and the way we then see things in the future and, and even in ministry. We get upset when we're not mentioned for something we did or were left out of, you know, being thanked when the Emmys were being passed out, right, for, for ministry. I didn't get my Awana Awards back in the days of Awana. I appreciate uh, Pastor Kent Hughes. Some of you know maybe who he is. You might know him by his book, uh, The Disciplines of a Godly Man. You might know his wife, Barbara, by Disciplines of a Godly Woman, the, the counterpart to that book. He struggled early in his ministry, as many pastors do with the challenges of ministry, watching others seemingly be successful and others not struggling. Just, in fact, so much so, later he wrote his struggles in a book called The Success Syndrome of Fear in ministry or just struggling. It's a great, great book. He shares in this, his darkest hour, he conveyed to his wife, Barbara. He said this to her, just in, in a line of a whole montage of, of things. But he said, quote, those who really make it in ministry are those with, with exceptional gifts. If I had a great personality or natural charisma, if I had celebrity status, a deep resonant voice, a merciless executive ability and a domineering personality, I could make it to the top, he said. Where is God in all this, he says. To Barbara. Continuing, quote, just look at the great preachers today. Their success seems to have little to do with God's spirit. They, they're just superior people, exclamation part, end of quote. This was his flesh speaking. His wife, very godly woman, grateful for godly women in her life to be able to say, in fact, she later says, Kent, I know you're strong. I don't know where you're at in your faith, but, but lean on my faith right now. Shows the importance of wives. Lean on my faith right now. And later, a little bit later in the, in the, uh, the book, he just talks about 
that the pragmatistic approach to ministry and about numbers and about influencing and, and, and doing things to try to basically add numbers to church rather than being faithful to teach the Word in season and out. Because we live in a pragmatistic society. Success is what you make. Success is how much you have. Success is not the success that God speaks of. Remember in Joshua, Joshua takes over the command of Israel. And what did God tell Joshua? You need to read the book, How to Influence People and Make Friends, right? No, no, that's not what he said. He said, you need to meditate on my word day and night. Don't turn from the left or to the right. And then you will be unsuccessful. Is that what he said? And you'll have success. Not the world's success, my success. You'll be doing what I've called you to do. In a way, like Peter, Kent was saying that, what about him? What about them? I'm struggling to minister to the church. Why don't they? Shouldn't they struggle as I do? Shouldn't they have the same problems I do? And what does God say? Notice verse 22 of our text. If I want him to remain until I come, Jesus says, what is that to you? You, Peter, follow me. Look at me, Peter. You have no idea what's in store for John or any of the rest of the disciples. Concern yourself with what I've called you to. Where I've placed you. Serve where I've planted you. In layman's terms, Peter, keep your eyes on your own ministry. Don't worry about what John is doing or the ministry I have for him. You follow me. John continues, and he explains here. Therefore, he says, this saying went out among the brethren that disciples would not die. That that, that disciple would not die, speaking of himself. And here he's correcting it in the Scripture. Yet Jesus did not say to him he would not die, but only if I want him to reign until now, until I come. What is that to you? Notice God's sovereignty. Notice Christ's sovereignty over each, each of our days. It's a great reminder to us. When you're having a bad day, the Lord's allowing it. Can I trust Him in it? Put your name in there. Look at me. Maybe He's getting your attention to challenge you to go back to the vine. Back to the vine. Draw from the vine. What others do or don't do is to have no bearing on what we are called to do. We follow and serve Jesus. Our calling may not be the most glamorous place. It may not even be where you want or think you should be or what you are, are, are praying for, but it is where we have been called because God is sovereign and, and, and we are put in that moment which may be pushing a mop or wiping a nose or other parts of little children's bodies in the nursery to clean up. And where we are, we are to do it for the glory of Christ. And that's what he says. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, the littlest things, do it for the glory of Christ. And even in the end, Jesus says in the parable of the seed and the sower, or, or of the, of the, of the uh, talents, he was faithful and little, I will give much. Just be faithful. Faithful where you're at. Faithful where you're at. These are lessons that we learn. The great preacher and theologian Jonathan Edwards embraced this fully. In his commitment to the Lord, he had many resolves. He wrote down that he was focused on. You might remember this one. Resolve that all men should live for the glory of God. Resolve second that whether others do or not, I will. I will. Is this our resolve? 
What is our resolve? Are we listening to God? Are we being faithful? Are we distracted? Do we get distracted by our things and not doing the main thing? Remember, God is sovereign in all things. God is working. And if somebody else is in a place where you think you should be, what's that to you? You look at me. Jesus says, you serve me where you're at. Don't worry about that person. And this has many applications. You might be a, not be the athlete you want to be or the, have, the, have the, the knowledge or, or mind that you want to have. But you have been made just the way Christ wants you to be for His glory. So stop getting ahead of Christ and submit to Christ and serve Him. There will be challenges from without and from within. and We're always reminded that Jesus is with us. Follow me. Follow me. Just the last thing here. Not only a purpose and provision that we learn, refining and restoration, but the cost and commitment, but also just the reassurance of the things written that God has given us His Word. I love this. this. He explains, this is the disciple I am who is testifying of these things, John says, and wrote, and these things, he says, we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if were written in detail, I suppose, he says, even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. That's who we follow. Him who came who lived, who, who died for our sins and rose again. We follow Him, the risen Savior. And we have in that the same, the same thing, the Word of God that is from Him. I love the words of Peter later in Second Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 19. Talks about the, of, of them who, 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 whom they've seen. It says, For we have not followed cleverly devised tales when, when we made known to you, the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For when we, He received honor and glory from God, the Father, such an utterance as this was made to Him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This is we witnessed. And then He says, and we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So, he says, we have a prophetic word more, made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in darkness, in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. We have a sure word. It's given to us by God. In fact, he's saying here it's even more sure than our eyewitness because this word is from, from God. We have a more sure word. So, as we continue on and we look at this world and it is, it is getting normally as we see because of sin, it's, it's, it's acting just as its nature. But ask yourself, how then will you live? in light of the resurrection. How will we live in light of the resurrection? Don't get distracted, my friends. Don't get discouraged because you're a place where you, don't, you wish you weren't. Or Just look at Him. Look to His Word. Amen. I'm going to pray and close and then we're going to pray and then we'll close together. So let's pray together. Father, thank You this morning for Your Word and Lord, so good. You are so good to us. God, that you redeemed us. Lord, that you were not, did not remain silent, but Father, you made a way to reconcile us from our reproach from you and our sin. And I pray this morning, if there's one here who doesn't know you, that God, that the words that are spoken this morning brought conviction because they don't know you, Jesus. The Bible tells us our sins 
have made a separation between us and you that you do not hear us. But you do hear, Lord, the knee bowed, the, the heart bowed down in repentance. And you tell us if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God, you raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. For it is with our heart that we believe that we have conviction in our heart, that we understand, that we know that we're sinners, that we need you. In our heart, we believe and are justified, declared righteous, and then it's with our mouth that we confess it and are saved because that which was in the heart comes out of the mouth. And so, Jesus, there's one here this morning and that you are drawing to yourself. Lord, would you bring them to the place of repentance, open their eyes to see that they would bow their knee humbly before you and their will to you and say, Jesus, I am lost, I am a sinner, and I am separated. Lord, save me, forgive me. Lord, make me righteous, declare me righteous by your death on the cross, which you took upon yourself my sins, that I may be declared righteous. Lord, you took the wages of my sin. And I have the free gift of salvation in you. I believe. I believe. And I want to live for you. You are my only hope. My only glory. I rejoice in you. I have been transformed from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of God in the beloved Son who redeems us and saves us, Lord, and forgives us of our sins, Lord. We thank you this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that we are never alone, that we're never alone. And so we draw on the vine. We are the branches. Apart from you, we can do nothing. And we say, amen, this is true. Amen, amen, in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you draw together with me this morning uh, for those? And uh, let's pray together for the next several minutes, and then Joseph will close. And I want you to pray specifically 